actually found my slides. Like I said, if anyone heard, uh, Al put them in plain view, which is why I couldn't find them. He sent me an email. So what I'm going to do is kind of review a little bit, maybe the first 10 or 15 minutes of what I was trying to talk about before, but was trying to draw with various, um, uh, some sort of chicken scrawl. So um, first we'll just go through a glossary. These are some of the terms that I should have told you about. Um, very important terms here are, uh, the first one is adsorption, which is an interesting thing. You know, you hear about adsorption and absorption. They're very much different, and you in groundwater you have to work with both of them. Adsorption is usually when a contaminant or something is attracted to just the surface of a particle. It doesn't dissolve in the particle. It just is a surface process. And you'll see that this happens all the time with metal ions. Sometimes it even happens with organics that, that are highly charged. But most of the time you're talking about two charged species. And we'll, we'll be seeing this and why this impacts groundwater contamination in the future. The other word is, that's pretty important here is advection. This is uh, the process by which uh, solutes are transported by the bulk mo motion of flowing groundwater. So that's the bulk motion. It's like the, the, groundwater, the groundwater flow as opposed to things like um, uh, things such as uh, molecular diffusion, which have totally different mechanisms. Alluvium, that's just a term for the materials that are, that are usually create your aquifer. Once again, I was telling you, your aquifers, particularly in Arizona, I don't know about a lot of other places, but they're very much like time machines. I think that right here in the Salt River Valley, the sediments go about 2,000 feet deep. So you could imagine how long it's taken to do that. There's a lot of water here. But each one of those is probably the Salt River moving across this thing with one flood event up to another. So it's called alluvium. Anzeotropic, we'll be talking about that today. That means it has a, hydro a hydraulic conductivity in a different direction. In other words, if the groundwater is moving this way, your, hydro uh, your, hydro uh, I mean, your hydraulic conductivity may be different in the way you're moving as opposed to at 90 degrees, which is very common. And what it does is it sometimes breaks up what you think would be this beautiful plume that should be out there. And in fact, the plume takes on a much different shape because of this anzeotropic uh, type of situation. Aquifer, as we talked again, that's wherever the water has a uh, basically a head greater than uh, uh, the atmosphere. So it, it, it basically forms pooling water. Your aquifers, of course, can be like a main aquifer, and then you can have various perched aquifers. It's interesting, I'll just talk about one legal thing. In the state of Arizona, there is actually a legal definition for aquifer. So when you're doing a contamination study, oftentimes, the first thing you want to do is you hit some water and you start bailing it, hoping that it won't hit, I think it's four gallons per day or something. If it's less than that, it's not considered an aquifer, which is really nice because then all of a sudden you could treat the thing like a, almost like just a soil problem as opposed to worrying about groundwater. An aquifer test, we kind of, I kind of alluded to it. It was very bad. A graphics trying to draw on this. I'm sorry, I will talk more about aquifer tests. But what you're doing with an aquifer test is you're trying to pump some water out, or in some cases called in a slug test, put some water in. And what you're trying to do is actually solve for and calculate uh, hydro, 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 hydraulic conductivity. An aquitard. Uh, I, I explained an aquitard a little bit. Those are very usually a very tight clay or a silt formation. And what that does is it breaks up your aquifer. You can have an aquifer that's actually suspended over another aquifer where literally it's dry soil, uh, an aquitard with some water over it, dry soil, <laughs> uh, uh, literally more water and uh, an aquitard, and then maybe dry soil and then your main aquifer. Or sometimes the aquitards are actually located within, within the uh, um, aquifer. So you have various aquitards through the aquifer, which can make it very exciting then when you, all of a sudden you find contamination and you put a well down and it's at three to four feet. But then when you got another well that's 50 feet, it's clean. Now you got to start thinking, I may be into aquitards. They're tough to find. 
Uh, most people aren't thinking about it. It takes a little more uh, drilling, um, more sophisticated drilling sometimes to do it. Uh, I will tell you, one of the more interesting aquitards I ever had, it was a fascinating one. I was doing a gas station in Flagstaff, Arizona, where the uh, San Francisco peaks are. And the San Francisco peaks come right down to the road, right there. And then if there's a, you come up, I think it's called Beaver Street, and there's a gas station there, and you go around it, and you're, you're on your way to Snowbowl. Well, there's a gas station right there. And believe it or not, that volcano stops right there, stops right there at that street. And so here you see this volcano with all its uh, basalt, and it's all fractured, and there's groundwater and uh, springs and everything else. And underneath it is one of the best, most beautiful clays you've ever seen. So this volcano four million years ago or whatever it would erupted actually came on a beautiful, uh, actually a beautiful clay that had already been there for millions of years before it. Well, that gets pretty interesting real fast that you think you've got rock everywhere because there's a volcano and it's not so true. You've got a beautiful aquitard. Artesian, again, confined under pressure. What happens is that uh, there's two confining layers, yet layers usually that are going up to some source of water, they're acting like a pipe, you drill into it and water comes out. Uh, that's what's known as artesian spring. Um, we talked about that. Capillary zone we talked about, they're very important. A lot of stuff goes on in the capillary zone thanks to bacteria. Uh, it's your best, it's your best, uh, it's sometimes your best friend because of the bacteria. Coefficient of storage, uh, you also, you often hear that's very important for remediations. You want to know how much an aquifer can, uh, releases or takes into storage per, per unit area of the aquifer per change of head. So depending upon how much head it changes and how much the, um, the, the area is, you can figure out how much water. Now what's the problem in California right now? Does anybody know what's going on in California? There's a drought, right? So what are they doing? They are pumping their aquifers like crazy because they have no water. What's happening to those aquifers? They're compressing. They'll never get this water back in. These aquifers are not going to recharge. There are places in the Central Valley, I think it's what, fallen 40 feet? The, 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 the land. So what's happened is it used to be the water was sitting in there and helped support the land. Now they're pulling it out and now those aquifers are going dry, but they're also being compressed. So now you can't get the water back in. So it's a, it's a twofer. Again, what happens there is your coefficient of storage, of course, is changing. You got one, your coefficient of storage is for what you can bring out, but you can't put it back in. Now, you probably don't understand this because you're all too young for this, and if you were not, uh, at one time, they wanted to build a series of, of dams upstream. One of them was Orm Dam. They wanted to put a couple of dorm dams, and they were defeated by environmentalists. And one of the things they said, well, where are we going to put all this extra water? Well, where do you think they put the extra water now? They actually just run it right into the Salt River. So you see those ponds that are just upstream? It looks like water's going into it. They're just recharging that water. Again, you have to have a good, good handle on how much storage you have there. But the nice thing about putting the water under, under the ground, of course, is you don't have the problem with loss of evaporation. But then as we learned last time, the problem is every time you put water into something, you don't get the same amount of water out. It's just like putting water in a bunch, a pail of, of soil. And if you put a gallon in a pail of soil and you try to get it out, if it's clays, you're not getting any of it out. But if it's sands and gravels, which is pre predominantly what you have in the salt river bed, if, you've ever, if you ever do any drilling, you will love the salt river bed. You have four feet, six feet of beautiful sands and silts, followed by a thousand feet of rocks this big and sand. It's very nice. That's why you see so many sand and gravel operations along the salt river. A cone of depression, we, we touched on that last time. That's when someone is actually, uh, they're, they're actually um, uh, sucking water out of the ground. If you, a very big cones of depression are done by agricultural or even municipal or mining. Uh, 
cone of depression is also done when you're doing like an aquifer test, which we alluded to last time. A confined aquifer is, is an, actually an aquifer that doesn't see the atmosphere. So it can act, be between two confining layers and it acts quite different. It could be artesian, but it doesn't act like the aquifer above it. And um, I did some aquifers in Casa Gran, which is about 40, 50 miles south of here, in which you have one confined aquifer after another confined aquifer after another, and some of them, the groundwater seems to be going in a different direction. It gets pretty exciting fast. Okay, diffusion. We're going to be talking about diffusion today, but it's a process whereby particles of gases, liquids, and solids intermingle as a result of spontaneous movement caused by thermal agitation. Now, we, we, we already talked about advection earlier, which is basically the movement of groundwater by uh, the movement of groundwater and how it moves the contaminant. Diffusion is quite different. It has to do with a concentration gradient, where your other gradient is usually your hydro, um, hydraulic gradient. And we'll go into that in just a second. Um, discharge, follow, um, uh, discharge velocity is what you calculate from Darcy's law. Again, what Darcy's law says is that if you have a per unit, a per unit um, area, and you put it out, in other words, you dug down to the, your aquifer and you had this per unit area, it's how much, it's how much volume of water should come out that per unit area. It's like a flux. It's, it's the, it's the meters per second that are coming out at you. And we're going to talk about that one more time. Dispersion, again, it's the mixing. It's the movement of these contaminants. These contaminants are going down, going downhill. They're going down the, uh, basically, the hydrologic gradient, and they're dispersing, and they're dispersing wi widely. Uh, the more, the smaller the, the grain of material, such as sand as opposed to gravel, the more the dispersion. That means that if an underground storage tank leaks right there at that corner, and you're sitting at this corner, is that stuff coming straight at you, or is it in a very dispersed? That all depends upon the, the, the particle size. Effective porosity. Uh, this is, I didn't go into the different types of porosity, but if you think about porosity, it's very much like foam. If you would buy foam in a store to put in your house for insulation, what kind of foams do you want? They always say that you want closed cell foams. Why closed cell foams? Because the air won't pass through it. In other words, each, each, of, the, each of the individual particles, I mean, each of the air spaces shouldn't be able to see the air space, so they act as an insulation. The porosity is high, but there's no way you can get any air through it or any water through it. Effective porosity says, Hey, we have high porosity, but we also have the channels that will unite all these. So sometimes what will happen in an area is you think you have a pretty good porosity and come to find out you have a lot of closed chamber, uh, channels. And again, it can be frustrating sometimes because you remember the way you have to get these samples. You have to get drill rigs. You have to pound. You have to drill at high temperatures. Sometimes the samples really don't tell you what's going on down there because they're pretty they're pretty messed up by the time you get them back. So you're trying, to, you're trying to interpret the results of what's really down there based on sometimes what's been ground up or broken up pretty badly. Evapotranspiration, uh, we're going to talk about that. Um, I think we don't need to talk about any of those. Groundwater, groundwater model. Uh, that's what we're going to kind of start talking about today as to what goes into groundwater models, and what do you got to think about? Again, advection, con um, convection, you're thinking about molecular diffusion, but you're also thinking about those are the bulk things that's happening with water. In other words, water is doing this. It's pressing you down. Water is also making you go through all the small channels, so you're dispersing. But on top of that, now you're going to have to worry about the chemical processes. In other words, how does a chemical bind to a, a soil particle and just sit there for a while, and then maybe it comes off, or maybe it's transformed. Or with bacteria, it's completely metabolized or turned to something even worse than it originally started out to be.
for instance, trichloroethylene, which is the big contaminant, people for years would say, oh, I have a reducing thing. I can reduce the trichloroethylene down to, and then they would reduce it to vinyl chloride, which was actually worse than what they, had, what, what they were starting out with. So, you know, be careful what you wish for. Yeah, it was remediation, just probably not the best thing you could probably do. Okay. Head where that's the, that's the, your, your pressure differential. Hydro, hydraulic conductivity, again, this is the thing that if you sit around and you listen to three geologists or three hydrogeologists, what you'll hear coming out of their mouth all the time is hydrologic, hydraulic, excuse me, hydraulic conductivity. What they're trying to do is figure out how much water this aquifer can pass. So they're taking a per unit area and they're asking how much water comes at me per day. In other words, how many meters per day or what's my volume that's coming at me per day. Uh, so it's a, it's a measure of flux and um, hydraulic gradient, of course, we talked about is the difference in head uh, versus length. So this is the driver. This is the driver for D Darcy's law. Darcy's law being really composed of the diffusion uh, hydraulic, conducti um, um, hydraulic conductivity and also the hydraulic gradient. Hydrograph, we'll probably talk about that. Um, impermeable, you can figure out what that is. Um, intrinsic permeability, I kind of stayed away from intrinsic per permeability because what intrinsic permeability or even the term permeability means isn't, it only talks about the aquifer material itself. It's not talking about the fluid and the aquifer material at the same time. That's why most people use hydraulic conductivity because that's both a property of the fluid and of the, of the media, where permeability is just of the media. Isotropic, um, what that means uh, as opposed to anzeotropic is that it's, it, the, the hydraulic conductivity is the same in all directions. Very rarely do you ever see that. When people tell me they have an isotropic um, uh, aquifer, I always think uh, you probably weren't taking enough data. Remember with these systems, the only simple system is the one you haven't studied. If you study a system long enough, it becomes very complex. It's like the only normal people are the people you don't know, right? As soon as you know someone, you realize they're not normal, which is no big surprise. And uh, well, that's the, the end of that. Perched permeability, we kind of talked about the, all those. Pisometer, that's usually a small well that's just used for figuring out what the depth of groundwater is. It's, very us it's usually not sampled. We'll talk about potentiometric surface at some other point. Uh, I think these are pretty. A slug test is like an aquifer test. I talked about a pump test, but it's, it's, it's done in a little different way. And sometimes not only do you take water out very fast to see how the, the aquifer uh, changes, but sometimes you drop a lot of water in. That's why it's called a slug, to see how it gets rid of the water. Both wa are, are, are ways of getting um, something, uh, some sort of parameter so you can calculate hydraulic conductivity. Again, each geologist or each hydrogeologist will, will use a different method depending upon how much they know and how much they're comfortable with, but also versus there are certain aquifers that, that do better with either a slug test or a pump test. Um, I'll leave these alone right now. Transmissivity, uh, what you do with transmissivity, I don't know if I kind of explained it, but your hydraulic conductivity is the amount, let's say that you're measuring per square foot, usually they don't do that, but you're measuring the amount of rate coming at you per square foot. What they'll, they'll also talk about is transmissivity, and what they do is they take that number and they multiply it by the depth of the aquifer. Now you know what's coming at you. And like I said, it's kind of a weird thing to think about it, it's like this big slice of toast that's coming at you, this water that's coming at you. That's what you have to kind of think of transmissivity. Then what you would do is that you would multiply it oftentimes by the width of your aquifer to figure out how much water is coming out of your aquifer total. 
And then the Vado zone, uh, Freeze and Cherry, of course, has to have their own definition. Uh, probably the best book on the I of contaminant flow and, and um, is, is written by Freeze and Cherry if you're ever going to work in the field. Uh, everybody has their own little thing of freeze, uh, freeze and Cherry, but it talks about what the Vado zone is. You know, it's, it's above the capillary fringe. Soil pores are only partially filled with water. Uh, the, the moisture content has to be less than porosity. If not, then the water would be falling out of it. Uh, the fluid pressure is less than atmosphere. That was the old toilet paper in the toilet thing. You want to know about capillary? Put a piece of toilet in the toilet paper. It goes up. You've, you've accomplished a great experiment. You can, you can quit science for the day. And then water table. Water table is an interesting thing. You, you can, most water tables are, are, are going up and down during the year. Some will do it just from the spring and the fall because of the rains. Uh, in Arizona, what you see, in, at least in the Phoenix area, is everything is about the Salt River and how much pumping is occurring by either the cities or the farms. So your water tables are very different. I think probably here, I bet you your water table is 200 feet. As you get closer to the Salt River, your water table probably can be somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 feet. After a flood, I've seen it come up as much as 30 feet right next to the... So think if you have a groundwater contamination problem, it may be gone after a big flood. It may be just flushed away. You would hope, but it never happens. Okay, so one of the things you have to worry about all this is, yeah, we'll be starting to talk in just a few minutes about the actual movement of groundwater and the dispersion of groundwater. But what you have to worry about with, with contaminants in, in the uh, groundwater and also in the soils is these chemical processes. Because what's happening at all the time is that your chemicals in the groundwater may not stay there. How do you know that? Well, let's say if you have gasoline. Everybody knows that gasoline would rather be on what? The soil probably more than than the water. So immediately, they, they are coating the soil particles. You get oxidation reduction reactions. These are uh, things mostly with metals. And what's happening there is, depending upon the, uh, the, ox the amount of oxygen in your groundwater, whether it's a reducing or, or an oxidizing type of, of, of aquifer, you could get metals coming in and out of solution in various forms, such as arsenic. It could be either arsenic-5 or arsenic-3. Chromium, you can have it as chromium-6, or you can have it as chromium-3. These don't happen very easily, but if you just read the papers, what's in everybody's drinking water now that everyone's worried about? Hexavalent chromium. It was a very, very common, um, it was a very, very common Thing that they would use in plating and to treat metals, and it's everywhere. I was working on a, a nuclear reactor in in Washington, and they wanted to know uh, <laughs> they wanted to know how much hexavalent chromium is is coming out of this old reactor to the Columbia River. So you're standing on the Columbia River, and you go, "Wow, this is pretty cool." And there's salmon spawning there, but you know, underneath the water from the old reactor, it was welling out into the Columbia River. Well, the problem with the Columbia River is they have dams on it. And the Columbia River could go up and down 10 feet in a day when they would either be pouring the water out to produce electricity or storing it at night. And it was really funny. Well, you could watch this chromium go back and forth based on the hydrological, I mean, on the, 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 on the, the head of the water. Uh, it's, it's pretty interesting. Uh, radionuclide decay, again, you can have tritium in the water. You can have uh, the place I talked about, which was Hanford. They built all the uh, plutonium for all the bombs uh, the United States used, and they're now closing it down. But they had strontium-90, iodine-129, Technetium 99, anything that you could think of, they had there. And it was, was moving along. And some of these things have half-lives of, I think Technetium 99 has a half-life of 99,000 years. 
But the beautiful thing is I could tell you how to get any job. If anyone has a tritium problem, you tell them immediately, hire me. I'll get rid of half your tritium in 14 years or 16 years. That's the half-life. I mean, you don't have to do anything. You could just take the checks and sit on a beach in Mexico drinking beer, and you'll be getting rid of it. But it, this is the kind of things. But sometimes, of course, the real nuclei decay actually decays into something that was worse than what it started. So it's, it's fun. Ion exchange. This is just like your ion exchange in your, in your houses. Uh, you know, many of the materials that are used to actually extract out these um, uh, these, some of these ions, you, it, you, what you really want to get rid of, of course, is iron, because it makes, and that's why it's, your water's hard, iron and calcium. The same thing goes on. There are things called clays, and clays are notorious for, for grabbing and holding different metal ions. So the, the nice thing is they're holding it. The bad thing is if the concentration in the water should change at some point, they start to give it up. It's not a one-way process. Um, and then, of course, sorption is the last one. And that's a little interesting. You know, you talk about, uh, you talk about uh, adsorption, or where it's just, it's just literally um, the ions are just on the surface. In sorption, what you have is you have organic carbon that's actually in the soil. A, a big part of soil, this is a fact of organic carbon. Certain organics literally dissolve into this organic carbon, and they'll stay there. There's actually a whole expression called the octanol water coefficient, which tries to emulate that um, movement and that absorption of um, organics out of the uh, out of the water and into the organic um, into the uh, uh, organic uh, organic carbon. Biological processes, bacteria. I'm going to tell you something. I started to work with bacteria. I told you this a couple years ago. I just thought it was the stuff that, that inhabited your toilet and, you know, the stuff around your shower. This stuff is amazing. If anybody ever says, is there life on ever other planets? The answer is yes. I'm absolutely convinced. It may be at 6,000 feet below the, the, the uh, or 2,000 feet below the, the thing of Mars, but I bet you there's a bacteria there that somehow has figured this out. These things can do anything, and how do you know that? Let's talk about antibiotics. Everybody's talking about it. They'll find a way. If you have the worst disease in the world and you come up with an antibiotic, they will find a way around it. And this is what they're doing down there. Even if they didn't like the taste of TCE or gasoline, there's so many of them and they have so many kids. Do they have kids? Well, you know, they have so many offspring that sooner or later, one of those guys is going to like the taste of gasoline. And as soon as he does, he gets all his kids to eat those things. And all of a sudden, in a, in a matter of no time at all, you find out that your remediation is really being done um, by these little guys. And so there, it's a pretty amazing what goes on there. I'm just going to say one thing about my research. I was asked to look at uh, making probes, an analytical probe for different things. And I said, yeah, 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 whatever. So I made these probes, and I've got them in buckets. Does anybody, you all know Kirill, right? He's one of my co, uh, um, what do they call it, co-investigators. We're getting correlation of these bacteria day after day of better than 0.999. You can't do that with a pH electrode. You can't do it basically with an ORP electrode. The bacteria. Measuring just the metabolism of bacteria, you can do better than you can do with, with a pH electrode. They're phenomenal. They're phenomenal. Okay, physical processes. Advection, that's just the movement of groundwater down, uh, basically down gradient. Hydrodynamic dispersion. The dispersion, of course, is depending upon what kind of rocks or what kind of sand you have, these contaminants have to go through this. It's kind of like trying to get around LA or Phoenix during, um, you know, quitting time. Sometimes the freeway isn't the fastest way. You know, you go down 40th Street, and then you go down Van Buren, and then you go this way. But it adds a lot to the contortion. But sometimes it's faster, and that path is more, is given to you, so you use it. Molecular diffusion. 
Most of the time, molecular diffusion isn't of great consequence to you because the movement of the groundwater or the actual eviction of this stuff going in and out of the pores is so great that the little bit that molecular diffusion adds is not much, but it's still an important process on how things get to and from the different particles as, as, as the groundwater goes along, these things are actually being absorbed by them and then they have to come back off. But the beautiful thing about molecular diffusion we'll talk about in a second is you can actually use it as a model for the other processes. And then one of the most important things I'll, I'll talk about here is fractured media flow. And what that is, you don't get that a lot in, in down here in Phoenix or in Tucson but you get to Prescott, Arizona, or you get to some places where there's hard rock. And what happens is there's really, the aquifers are really just messed up, broken up rock with a little bit of soil in it, and it's really the rocks, and it's the fissures in the rocks. And so what you get with fractured flow, media flow is, now you don't really have great groundwater models because it's, it's nothing that's, that's similar in any direction. I actually had a site, a, a, an underground storage site in, in Prescott, and we couldn't figure out what was going on. We used all sorts of things, and we found out there was a giant fault with limestone on one side and granite on the other, and it went right through the middle of the site. There was just no way to model that site. All you could do is try to figure out a way to clean it up. I think they're still trying to figure out a way to clean it up. And again, this is a, a small thing. Groundwater, the capillary rise. The capillary rise, of course, is totally de dependent upon the material that involved. Gravels and, and sands don't have as high a, a rise. The pore spaces filled with, with air. And of course, the soil moisture in the top from irrigation or just from rainfall. So you can actually have some areas that are actually drier, uh, deeper down. And we talked about, we're not going to talk ag again about capillary. This again was a, a graphic I couldn't show you very well, but it shows the centimeter rise based on the material. As you could see, fine gravels give you practically no rise, and the silts do. So uh, this becomes very important. Porosity, we, we talked about. It's the, the volumetric ratio between the uh, the spaces and the total rock. And again, porosity, which seems crazy, is that there's more porosity in clays than there is in gravels. And porosity, when they talk about the different types of intrinsic or anything, it has to do a lot about um, how they're packed. I don't know if you've had physical chemistry classes, but you're always talking about packing sometimes on how molecules pack and how it, it impacts the density. Packing is all important. Won't talk about that. Okay, hydrologic conductivity. And this shows you some of the hydrological conductivities in centimeters per second. Again, the centimeters per second, they're probably, you know, it, it depends upon the unit area they're doing, uh, but I mean, it shouldn't matter. Uh, but as you can see, the clays, the gravels are much higher, even though the gravels have what? Less porosity. And the high, that's, that's not a 9 at the top, that K equals, that should be a, a Q. Uh, sometimes my eyes aren't as good as they used to be. The interesting thing about this, of course, is that Everything happens because of a hydrologic, uh, a hydro, excuse me, a hydro, hydraulic con, um, gradient, and uh, and some sort of um, constant, and that's what you're trying to figure out. In just a second, we're going to see something else like that. Transmissivity is the hydrological, con, um, is the hydro, uh, I mean, the hydraulic conductivity mo times the the depth of the uh, of the um, uh, the aquifer. Darcy's law. There was actually other people that were exploring this. In capillary tubes, there's, I forgot the guy's name, a French scientist that actually found that uh, the, the, the difference in the he head, the, the, the height versus the length, um, was, was impacting the flow. Darcy's the first one and actually did it with sand. And this just kind of shows you what kind of, what kind of, um, um, uh, volume you could expect out of a cross-sectional area per day. This was actually for uh, uh, an aquifer from England. 
Velocity, of course, is a little different. Even though that amount of water, if you would, if, if you thought about it as a you know science fiction thing, if you took away all the aquifer except that one mile and a hundred uh, uh, the hundred feet and the one mile, what would come out at your feet would be two hundred and fifty thousand. I mean, what was it? Two hundred and fifty thousand uh, cubic feet per day of water. But depending upon whether it squirts out real far <laughs> or it just drools out is the porosity. And you could imagine if you still had to put 250,000 gallons through there every day and you had real small pores, they're probably shooting out. That means the velocity of the individual particles is going much faster. So to, to figure out the, you think it's meters per second with the, hydro, the hydraulic conductivity, I mean conductivity, you think that's a flow. That's the average velocity of the, of the, um, of the, wa uh, the water uh, particles in the water, and it's not. That's how much. That's how much water would be produced at the end. For the velocity, you have to put back the porosity term. And so there's this little thing here. It shows uh, if your porosity is 0.2. Uh, how it would affect the, the, the average feet per day. Aquitard, we've gone over all this. I think we're almost out. Contain, um, confined aquifer. Again, um, interestingly enough, uh, your potential metric surfaces now can be much different for a confined aquifer than the aquifer around it. In other words, if I had put a well in a Let's say that, there, that the top was actually another well that was exposed to the atmosphere and I put a well there. I may find that the, 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 the static water level in the well for the upper aquifer is right at where you would think it is. Now, if you drill down and you get in a confining aquifer, all of a sudden, this, this water level can be much higher than the static water level for the under one. What does that mean? You've got like almost artesian conditions or it could be much less. And that's usually the way you know you got a aquitard in a confining aquifer is when you put these things in and your wells are at different, different levels. Immediately you got to be start thinking, oh my goodness, I have multiple aquifers here. And this just shows the reason that, it's, that they're like that, the confining areas are actually trapping the water in between it and they're transferring that head, so to speak, from the top of the hill or the recharge down to some lower level. And this kind of shows it where you can have an aquitard, a confined aquifer, an aquitard, and a confined aquifer. Oftentimes, the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality, if they know that you have a confined aquifer, they want you to go down the aquifer to figure out if it's contaminated. These are the most contentious arguments in the world. Why don't you want to do that? Because what if you use the world's stupidest driller? and he doesn't plug the hole properly. Now all the contamination goes down to the other aquifer. So oftentimes you're trying to say, please let us clean up the first one so we don't dirty up the second one. And they said, oh no, you can use a perfect driller. There's two words that can never be used together. A perfect driller, I will tell you. And all you have to do is listen to the worst jokes in the world to realize that you are using a different type of human being on that job. No, most of my friends are drillers, but whew, there are times. Okay, potentiometric surface. We talked about Darcy's Law. Again, depending upon uh, the type of material, uh, the pore size can, can speed up and slow down your groundwater. It can also make a path length different, and there's actually friction. So it's, it, it gets to be kind of exciting to interpret this. Now, this kind of shows what happens when, from the distance from your source, and you just have advection plus dispersion, what happens over time, over time or distance from your source? The concentration of your contaminant you would expect to go down. And that's true. I'm going to go to this. But this is what happens in that same thing when you have advection, which is what you had before, but now you also have retardation. What do they mean by retardation? That can be all those molecular and chemical processes we talked about. It can be 
bacterial action. It can be ionic, um, ionic exchange. It can be uh, the oxidation reactions. And so what happens is you would think based on your models that the, the contamination should be much farther downstream, and it's not. So now you have to be looking about what's going on. This, of course, is when your client jumps up and down and just kisses you because he realized he's getting it cleaned up for less than he thought he was. These are also really very nice because these are the times when the agencies will maybe say, you don't have to do anything else because we see natural attenuation going on. We don't see that putting in any more money into the site is worth it. It's not getting across the street. So remember, there's a big difference between something being contaminated and a risk. A lot of things are contaminated. Are they a risk? And the beautiful thing about what's happened in the last 10 years is the agencies, the EPA, the state agencies, are moving from hazard or just saying something's contaminated, and now they're asking the question, is it a risk? And that's a quite a bit different. Right now, I, 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 I hate to talk about this, but I will. I'm almost ready to be sued <laughs> because uh, guy wanted to build on a landfill. I said, fine, you want to build on a landfill? You got to tell everybody it's a landfill, it's contaminated. He said, yeah, but I want to build on the landfill. I said, if you want to build on a landfill, then do a sup you got to do two things. He, I said, they said, what? Cap the landfill, asphalt cap or a building. Underneath the building, put, put vapor barriers so that anything that comes up. Now, underneath that scenario, you're in the perfect world. What's the whole thing about contamination? Don't breathe it, don't touch it, don't eat it. If you cap a site and you can't breathe it because you've got it, what's your risk that you're on a landfill? The answer is none. People go nuts when they find out this is contaminated. And you say, yes, it's contaminated. Have you ever been in a ship? Jump overboard the ship. How long are you going to survive in the salt water? Should we count it, depending upon the temperature and the salinity and how good of a swimmer you are? Not very long. That's called a risk. In the ship, it's not very much of a risk. So you have to understand, you're moving into an area that 20 years ago, when I first got into it, everything was, a, everything was contaminated. It had to be cleaned down to the last possible molecule. Not so much anymore. It's a different world. Sometimes I don't even agree with it. They'll go a little bit too far, like, you know, I don't think I want to live there. We won't go into retardation. Okay, um, how do I go to the next? Uh... So, tools? Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, aquifer too. Okay, so let's now start talking about what does this stuff really do? So the first thing we're going to talk about is molecular diffusion. Molecular diffusion is nice to talk about, but in, in most situations in aquifers, it's, it's not a factor, but it's still a good, good way to start. Molecular diffusion, in fact, is, is, is random motion. And by that, it sets up a gradient. So right here, what we say, here's the width of a mixing zone. In other words, we got two media on our side. We got a mixing zone. And it just so happens that if you would take R squared, I mean S squared, which is the distance, each distance from the middle, and square it and put it versus time, you get pretty much a straight line. And of course, now, because it's a straight line, you have a slope, and now you get to call the slope something. And what do scientists and geologists always call slopes? <gasps> Defer, you know, coefficients, dispersion coefficients, diffusion coefficients, whatever, in other words, it's the fudge factor you're going to use in your final calculation. You need a fudge factor, and here you're going to calculate it. So the most important thing in diffusion is fixed law. And fixed law is, is a fascinating law, and it says that the mass flux which is the mass per unit time coming through a unit area, coming through a unit area, has a fudge factor, which is your diffusion coefficient, and, and a, a, a um, excuse me, a concentration 
a concentration gradient. Now, let me tell you something. I remember a movie when I was a kid, one of my favorite, Mary Poppins. Mary Poppins told the kids at one point, you know, if you find the fun in every job, the job becomes fun. When you realize what science and technology is telling you, it becomes fun because it's like, where's Waldo? Does anyone see what we talked about just 10 minutes ago? Hydraulic conductivity, which was what? It was the change in head over the change of length with a fudge factor gives you the amount of stuff coming through an area per unit time. Duh, what's this? This isn't, it's different, but it's the same thing. There's a, there's a gradient being set up, and that gradient is transporting something through a, an area at right angles to the direction of flow. Most of the times in science, you could probably sit around if you had nothing to do in life. You don't want to hear about Kim Kardashian or some other, some other thing. But if you just sat there with your iPad late at night and looked at all the scientific formulas, you'd probably be able to throw them in about three different bins. And once you start doing that, then you could start seeing these relationships, which makes it a lot more fun. And we're going to see a few more of those. But essentially, Here's Fick's law that's telling you that if you have a gradient set up by concentration and a fudge factor, you can figure out how much is coming through per unit area. And if you remember Darcy's law, look at it, look at them both. Appreciate the, the beauty of this. Now, how do you use this for contamination studies? Well, you can use it kind of like this. Let's say that we have a control volume. And we'll make the control volume uh, delta x in, in, in uh, as you could see, along, along the same plane as the uh, a screen, a y-axis and, and a z-axis. And now you have q, which is the amount of mass per unit time coming into this box. Ta-da! It's coming into my box. And then after a certain amount of volume, I want to know what's coming out. Well, of course, what's coming out has got to be that whatever went in plus whatever gradient, dq dx, times x, x is just the length of the crazy thing, times dy or delta y delta x. What it's telling you is that what's going in may not be coming out or may not be captured. So what's the difference? DQ DX. What is DQ DX telling you? Something's going on in the box. Something's going down in the box. So how do I do this? Uh, is it Jeff? How? Oh, okay, Windows tab twice. Okay, just a second. Oh yeah, Windows tab twice. Now, see? I don't know if it was the 10 years at ASU or the four years in the Navy, but I can't do this. OK. So you know, looking at this, that box again, I just want to show you what's happening. If you just look at it from one thing where you're just looking at x, what you're really saying here is that q is coming in, and then something is happening to q. There's a slope here. And guess what that is? dq dx. Now, if nothing comes out, that dq dx got rid of everything. That was the super box. That's the kind of box you wanted every remediation. But that's the gradient of something going down. That's what that whole box is about, and that's what that whole slope is about, trying to predict what's going through that box. Now, what do I do again? Windows, tab, tab? Windows, tab, tab. Oh, see? C, yeah, uh-huh, you always want to blame me. Now, what's interesting about it is that, that if you look at the, the, the units of measurement of the uh, dq dx, which is that little bit of movement or that, that something is going on with that, that stuff in that box, and you rearrange all the units, it in fact is dc dt. 
DC, DT is? The difference in the concentration over time. Wow, think about that. Now we have some sort of difference that was happening over a space, and now we can equate it what kind of difference is happening over time. Great. So, if we resubstitute back into, if we resubstitute back into uh, Q, um, I think it's one of the equations that we re, we. It, this doesn't have all the equations, but essentially what we finally find out is that the DC DT is equal to the second derivative of DC DX. In other words, how DC DT is related to DC, uh, D, uh, the second derivative of, of, of concentrations versus X. So it shows you how time and distance are being, are related. And notice, once again, you got a fudge factor. You got to always have a fudge factor. And that's usually the, when you, when you graph these, that's usually the slope of your line. That's how you find your fudge factor. That's why slope is so, so now if we, we take the advection uh, equation and we're asking how much stuff is coming out per unit time, we have a convective flow. The convective flow is nothing more than the velocity of the groundwater times, times the uh, concentration plus now the diffusion and its random, its, its random diffusion, which we, we saw from Fick's law. Now, of course, anyone in, that's got half a brain that thought about it long enough is going to say, wait a minute, if my groundwater is going at three feet a day and diffusion is going at this really small rate in the water, it becomes pretty small. Why worry about it? Because we can use it as a, a way of evaluating the other types of dispersive pro problems, and we'll look at that in just a second. So when we, we, we substitute in the continuality um, equation, what we find out is we have an equation um, that we can, we can use now that relates concentration, time, and in, in fact, some distance. And we can also, of course, put it in a three-dimensional in Cartesian coordinates. So we have, you know, basically a partial differential uh, of this, uh, this entire equation in three dimensions. So convection then is basically the, the, main, the main way of the way this groundwater is going. Dispersion, however, dispersion, if we talk about dispersion as, as kind of now a surrogate for where we had the molecular diffusion of term, now we're talking about something else. Now we're not just talking about this little molecular diffusion, but we're now we're talking about all the stuff that happens between the rocks, between the layers, everything that adds and disperses this stuff around. And we can, we can use that in place of, in that first equation, we can use that in place of molecular diffusion. In other words, we're supplementing that with all these other dispersive um, qualities. And what we find out is that dispersion coefficients are usually anxiotropic. In other words, if the groundwater is moving in that direction, the dispersion is much greater in that direction than it is off to the sides. And that's very important because think about it, if it was just as equal off the side, these plumes would get very, very wide. Well, they tend to be pretty small. You know, you can see a plume come across and you can get both sides of it, unless you're working at Motorola 52nd Street and then it's just, 10 miles long in every direction. Uh, and they are also velocity dependent. The amount of dispersion depends on velocity, and we're going to be looking at that in a second. And again, dispersion can be done, it's the property, the porosity, the conductance of the pore channels. I hate these geology terms. Where do they get torchovicity? God, can't they come up with something else? Can't they call it Michael's number or something? Make it sexy, torrid. I can't even say it. Don't you hate English? Okay. <laughs> um, so now let's talk about what's really going on, and we're going to talk about an impulse input. What's an impulse input? We're going to put a little bit of contamination in the aquifer for like an instant, like kind of like a truck 
a truck going over, or someone just absolutely does whoops, 55 gallon drum, uh, which happens. And we're going to try to look at uh, what's going on with it. And so our equation for this, when you look at the whole equation, is that top one. I don't know about you, but that looks like that looks like my worst nightmare, like when you wake up and you've seen too many bad movies. But luckily, luckily, the second equation is kind of interesting. The second equation down there looks similar, or this equation down there, the, the, the bottom one, looks similar to the top one. But that is just the normal distribution equation. That's the one you always work with when you're trying to figure out how much error you have or anything else. And if you look at the top one and you look at the bottom one, see there's a one and, a, and the, on, at the top you have an M and then the, the, and this is in the first term or this first term, I, I can't do this on the thing, but in the first term and look at the, the second, the, the first term, the, the, uh, the, the denominator. See it has two pi e, and there, that T shouldn't have a square by the way. Uh, and then the bottom one has two pi sort of sigma. Well, what if we take that sigma and we say it's equal to ET? Okay, so we'll make that substitution. And what if we take this U here, see in the, in the equation of the normal distribution, U is usually your standard deviation. What if we take that U and we substitute the, the velocity term and the time term up there? After a while, this thing starts to look just like a bell-shaped curve, and that's all important. So, here's your bell-shaped curve. And guess what? If you play with the parameters in the bell-shaped curve, you can get the bell-shaped curve to be thinner, or you can get the bell-shaped curve to be wider. And that's exactly what this equation does. What this equation does is in the beginning, it's very narrow and it's quite, it's very, and quite high. Over time, this equation starts to open up just like your, just like the, uh, the equation. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is in the bell-shaped curve, if you have a lot of stupid people in your class, the bell-shaped curve gets pretty darn flat. If they're all really intelligent, all the people are in, you know, pretty much in the middle, and it's very hard to give an A and a B. I am always the one bringing that curve down, so I, I don't know what the middle is like, so I wouldn't know. But that's what's happening here. So in the beginning, the beginning, the curve is very high, and it starts to expand out and get lower and lower. What is the two things that are going on here? The dispersion is the term in that equation. The term, the, the dispersion is the term in that equation that uh, I think it's in this thing, it's your standard deviation, which of course, if you remember with your standard deviation in a normal case curve is what expands it out. So as time goes on, you would expect this plume to just start to get broader and broader and the final concentration start to go down. That's if you only have dispersion and velocity. Now what's interesting at this, I, I should say that this is if you're, this is that equation, if you're sitting there at different times, if you're looking at different times, time one, time two, and time three, that's what this curve would look like at those different times. So maybe time one is one year, time two is two years, time three is three years. That's what your curve would look like at those, th at those things. That's your concentration and, your, and, your, and your, the broadening. Of course, why is it broadening? Dispersion. Theoretically, theoretically, the same amount you know, of material is underneath that curve, but it's been dispersed. Now here's the interesting thing. What if you're sitting out at a distance and so you're at 300 feet and you want to watch this plume come through versus time. It's not a pure Gaussian shaped curve. In fact, it's actually skewed. Now, 
Let's talk about one second. We're going to talk about Euler. Does anyone know who Euler is? See, everybody knows Kim Kardashian. They know what's the girl that played in the movie that's getting a divorce. Everybody knows that. Read the life of Euler. He was a genius. E, the, the, the thing E is where we get from Euler. And he was a genius. And if you read about it, one time his house got burned down by the, the, uh, the empress of uh, Russia. And he got captured because he was working for the, uh, the, the king of Prussia. And the Russian general felt so bad, this was like in the 1780s, during the Seven Years' War, that he rebuilt the house. And then they gave Euler actually a position in the Russian court. Fascinating stuff. You couldn't make this stuff up if you wanted to. But he invented the word, the, the, the concept of E. If you're going to learn something today, learn only this. Why is E so important? Let me tell you exactly why it's so important. How did he discover it? Everybody's going, wow, he was thinking something mathematically really important. He was asked to figure out by, I think, Venetian bankers how much interest they could make off of their money. In other words, if you take a dollar and you pay 100% interest on it, but you only compound it once a year, how much do you have at the end of the year? Two dollars. What if you compound it, the one dollar, you compound it twice a year? How much do you have? I think it comes out to two dollars and 25 cents. What if you compound it every month? I think the number comes out uh, two dollars and 60 cents. What if you do it 365 times? You compound it every day, you take the money, you take the money, you take the money, and you take the money, and you compound it. I think it comes out at 2.716. What if you do it infinitely? You compound it every day. Compound, I mean, every second, every moment. Infinity. You got E. What E is, is the natural growth curve of the world. It is everything. It, it makes life simple. It comes from, you can't come from it from algebra. It comes from calculus. But what it is, it's the holy grail to understanding almost every scientific inspection. And it came from trying to figure out how much money you can get from poor people. Just like probability and statistics. Have you ever read the probability of statistics? What it was, was these guys were asked to come up with a, some money for a prize. And the question was, some lord said, if I was gambling all night and there was this much money in the pot and I was holding these type of cards, what would be the chance I would win? That was why probability came up. Not comes some great astrological thing. Someone trying to make a buck, and they asked a couple of smart guys, hey, can you tell me if I can leave tonight and go see my wife or whether I'm going to have to play the whole hand of cards? This is pretty, you should read some of this stuff. It's fascinating. You're going, really? I thought it was some guy in a math book. No, no, it was guys sitting around a bar, which... I kind of like. So let's just, I'm going to do the, I'm going to do the windows and I'm going to, I can go to the next slide, right? Go. Okay. So here is Euler's number. And this is why it's all important. So at zero, the function of E is one. And at one, the function of E is two. I think 2.718, I think that's true. Probably someone else knows it. So there's your natural growth curve. It's going up there. What does that do? That tells you bacteria growth. It tells you growth of everything. But of course, what they always have with an E to the X? Of course. What goes with every scientific equation? The fudge factor. Without the fudge factor, you're not worth anything. So. What you have to do for radioactive um, lifetimes is figure out the, the fudge factor for strontium-90 versus the fudge factor for uranium. But the most important thing is can you recognize that equation? Now notice what happens to E. E doesn't stop there. E continues down and never hits zero. So in other words, over here is negative E. Well, what is exactly negative E if I said now E negative x. That starts at 1, 
and goes down there. Infinity. Holy Hannah, if you see an equation then that has a fudge factor and either the thing, you know this is a degradation curve. Immediately you can look at it and say, I'm in degradation. Or I'm in growth. But the most fascinating thing that you have to worry about aquifers, bodies of water is if you have a hundred, a hundred, if your chromium concentration, let's say you got hexachromium concentration, and some guy's trying to pollute your lake, and he starts throwing chromium into the lake, and he's got he's only got 100 parts per million in his vessel. What's the highest concentration the lake can ever get to be? 100 parts per million. But you know how it does it? You just you're just going to love this. If not, you're just not into you're just not into this stuff. That equation is basically the concentration equals the original concentration one minus e to the minus t. Now you think about it, and there it is. What is that concentration telling? You? It says when t is zero, c is c. Yay! So we're right there. In other words, this crazy is going up to some ultimate concentration and staying there. If you're looking around in science and you've got this giant equation and no time, you've got to go out, you know, the big dates tonight. Look around for the E. Look around for if it's got a minus sign or something there. Look around for the fudge factor. Because usually what will happen is you have these huge equations and there's a very big fudge factor in front of a T or an X. And usually it's always a dimension, right? It's going to be Y, X, Z, or T. So once you know that, then you, you know Euler's number. And we talked about, of course, the the statistics and how you could look at some of these curves. Most people are looking at the curves and saying, well, one standard deviation is 68%, so everybody within here is 68%, and two standard deviations of this. But you can also look at that curve as a living being, the curve itself. So coming back to all that, let me see. I can do this, tab, tab. What, in our original equation, you could see there was exponential and there was this, this dispersion thing that we were, we were talking about, this dispersion thing that we were talking about, but that we also had a minus kt at the end. That minus kt is actually a rate constant that's going to describe what's going to happen with all the things lumped together, such as ion exchange, bacteria action, and everything else. So... We were at, at all this stuff here. We were looking at the, this, this material here. We're assuming that that's all, that's at zero or it doesn't exist. What we're asking with these curves is what does the dispersion do? What does it do with nothing in, 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 the, uh, in the, its way? Whoops. But what if you bring K back in? K has what? It has a, if you notice what K has, minus KT. So with no K, what happens? With no K in those things, those curves are going down just by dispersion. And they're going down the field with that widening of that standard deviation curve. But now if you actually have some chemical processes, there's a rate now, there's a rate that, that's taken this stuff away. So as you would imagine, let me see if I can do this again. Tab, tab. What's happening is you have these curves like this one and this one and this one. And what you're doing is you're looking at it over time. And this is with K being zero. In other words, that's just, that's just the dispersion and the convection of bringing this downfield. But now if you add in that last term, that e to the minus kt, some flood factor times t, now that's the other chemical processes. And what that does is it comes over there. And so what your curves really start looking like is the dispersion and the um, 
convection being brought down field. And then on top of it is a degradation of the curve because of the chemical processes or the bacteria processes. This is one way of looking at what's going on. And like I said, if you learn anything, you're not going to remember these equations. Yeah, you probably can't spell contamination. I can't spell on a good day. But one thing you should learn is E. It's going to help you in so many fields. And if it, you ever want to remember about E, just remember about your credit card, E, credit card. How much can they get from you? They can only get 2.718. They can't get any more. So it doesn't matter to them if they compound it infinitely or they compound that 100% thing for 365 days. I think the difference is only two cents. So that's why they stop at a certain point. It's just not worth it. Okay, I think that's it. So anyway, we'll start doing the actual transport, but this is how stuff goes through the aquifer if it's an impulse. It just gives you an idea of how the, the widening happens. And it does it with two simple equations or two simple concepts. OK, thank you. <laughs> well, the, the concepts are simple. You know, everything is simple. I mean, the idea of a car is simple. Four wheels, you know. But there's a difference between a Chevy and a Maserati. I understand that. <laughs> oh, okay, thank you.